Yeah, that's your presentation, Jen, two and a half hours. What's up? That's your presentation, two and a half hours. <laughs> Coffee time. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Boy, then I'm going to really draw the crowd over from the Bill McKibben lecture. Just making sure everything's good sure. here. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Appreciate everyone coming out tonight. Um, before I uh, introduce uh, Jen, um, we're going to hold questions tonight for the uh, end of the lecture, so we'll let Jen get through all her slides, or as many as she can, and uh, then we'll open it up uh, on the floor and do the same thing. I have a wireless mic, so we'll pass it around so we can hear. Um, so my name is Mark Poharnwa. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a senior programmer analyst uh, based out of our Whiteface Mountain Field Station office for the Atmospheric Sciences Research Center. And I have the distinct honor of introducing tonight's speaker, as well as the privilege of participating with Jen in the inaugural Blue Buns Wheel of Palooza bike ride this past February in the Saranac Lake Winter Carnival. And as the name implies, yes, we were riding bicycles in our bathing suits in early February. So to our speaker, <laughs> and Jen is very grateful I didn't bring pictures from that. Yeah. <laughs> So as a director of climate initiatives, Jen Kretzer leads the Wild Center's climate change engagement programs, including the group or the Global Youth Climate Program, which was highlighted by the Obama White House Office of Science and Technology. In 2021, she led the Wild Center's youth climate delegation at the UN COP26 climate conference in Glasgow, Scotland. Jen serves on the Climate Literacy Energy Awareness Network, or CLEAN, the U.S. Action for Climate Empowerment Coordinating Team, or ACE, and is the board member of the Adirondack Mountain Club and core team of the Adirondack Diversity Initiative. Jen was the 2022 recipient of the Adirondack Conservationist of the Year. So please join me in welcoming Jen Kretzer. Yeah. You need to press record, are we all set? Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming out tonight. I'm especially grateful now that I know that Bill McKibben is speaking across the way. And as I mentioned, you um, feel free if you're like, oh my gosh, I need to go hear Bill. Like, go hear Bill. He's great. Um, of course. Um, so I'm really grateful to Mark and to SUNY Albany for inviting me here for this program this evening. Um, I came down from the Adirondacks today and it was like, you know, traveling ahead like a month because there were buds and birds and flowers. It was really, I felt like a tropical vacation practically. Um, so it was, it was lovely, uh, lovely to come down here. Um, so I want to share tonight a little bit about, um, our work at the Wild Center, which I'll talk about in just a second, and as well as give you kind of a, a really brief, just to set in context, um, a little bit about what's happening in terms of climate change in New York State. I am not a climate scientist, I am a climate educator, um, but we of course use science and talk about science um, as a grounding to help us understand why it's so important to start acting on climate change. Um, so I'm going to be really uh, excited to share a little bit about that, but mostly focus on some of the work we're doing at the Wild Center. Um, before we get too far along, oops, Let's see. Um, so how many folks have you, how many folks have been to the Wild Center before? Anybody? Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. We love visitors. We're just about to open for our 18th season on May 5th. Um, this is a really incredible view of the, uh, the Racket River and Wild Walk, uh, below we sit right on the banks of the Racket River. I would like to acknowledge um, that we are on, we are situated on the contemporary and traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee people. Um, so Tupper Lake is right, kind of right up here um, on Mohawk territory. And if you're not familiar with this map, um, nativeland.ca, um, it's at, based out of Canada, this website. And you can look at any place in the world and understand and have a better understanding of um, the indigenous people that lived there or once lived there. So I encourage you to um, look, check that out. 
Um, so the Wild Center, again, is located in Tupper Lake, New York. Our mission is to ignite an enduring passion for the Adirondacks, where people and nature can thrive together and offer an example for the world. I like to think of us as a science center, a nature center, an aquarium, all mashed up. We're focused on connecting people to the natural history of the Adirondacks, to the native species that live there, and um, to really also explore and see wilderness um, and the Adirondacks in a new way. Many of the folks that come to the Wild Center, over 60% of them, happen to be new visitors to the Adirondacks. So we really take pride in connecting people to a place that we really love. Uh, we focus um, strongly on the environment, the economy, um, and on education, of course. Um, our museum situated in the small town of Tupper Lake helps to, um, we have over uh, 40 uh, full-time staff and employ about 90 uh, seasonal staff, particularly during the summertime months um, when we have our, most of our visitors. We also uh, really strongly focus on school-based education and outreach into schools through um, my program, the climate, um, the youth climate program, which I'll share about in just a moment. Um, but we we are a great family place to visit. Um, so I would really invite you to come and I'll talk a little bit about more about some of our specific programs later on. So tonight we're going to talk about climate change. So the first thing, because I'm an educator and you're all currently here in this room, um, kindly listening to me speak, we're actually going to talk about climate change. As it turns out, um, 76 of Americans know that climate change is happening, know that it's human cause, but we don't talk about climate change at all. So I'm gonna invite you right now to find a friend, could be someone sitting next to you, behind you, a little group of you. And I'd like you to spend a couple of minutes just talking about what is something you have heard about climate change that has stuck with you. So find a friend, this is Partner Up, I'm an educator. We're, I'm gonna make you talk to people, it's true. <laughs> You guys could maybe partner up or someone could come forward and to sit with this lovely woman. What's, what's one thing that's Welcome, welcome. Come on in, folks. You haven't missed much. We just started and we're having a short conversation about what's something um, that you've heard about climate change that has stuck with you, or maybe something you think about when you hear the words climate change. Okay, another 10 seconds. <laughs> Mark's counting it down. Okay. Thank you for participating in my little icebreaker. Maybe you met some new people tonight. Um, one of the things we'll talk about when we start talking about solutions is the importance of building relationships and community so we can build on taking collective action around climate change. Um, so I, I thank you for participating in that. Um, in that. So what do we need to know? We need to know that it's real, that it's happening, that it is us, it's urgent, we have the solutions and that we can all make a difference. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter what you live, where you live, it doesn't matter what you studied, it doesn't matter if you went to school or not, it doesn't matter what profession you've been in. You, we can all make a difference when we talk, start talking about climate change. So just to be clear, and this might be old hat, and I mentioned that again, I'm not um, a climate scientist, but I think it's really important that we understand the difference between weather versus climate. You might all remember, and I can't remember which congressperson it was when he brought a snowball into Congress and like chucked it and said, here, climate change. 
And that image is stuck stuck with me. That's one of the things as <laughs> just such misinformation because there is a lot of misinformation out there. When we think of weather, weather is like the single day. Like it's, we're looking outside, we're seeing this um, beautiful day or the snowy day or the cold day or the hot day. That's weather. When you think about climate change, you're really talking about long-term trends. What are we observing over the long term? What type of warming are we seeing? What type of ocean acidification are we seeing? What type of species decline? And so we're looking at that for the long term. Um, I've heard it described as um, sort of the outfit you wear is weather, what's in your closet is climate. So you can think about it in that way if you'd like to, but it is, we're thinking about the long haul. We know that it's real and we know that it's us. So 97% of climate experts say, that humans are changing uh, global temperature. As it turns out, it's actually closer to 100%. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe is an amazing climate scientist based out of um, Texas. She's also the lead climate scientist for uh, the Nature Conservancy and has an amazing YouTube program called Climate Weirding and wrote, just wrote a book called Saving Us. Uh, Dr. Hayhoe says, or actually did a research on that 3% that 90, between 97 and 100 of scientists that disagreed and looked at those papers and, and said, hey, you're cherry picking data. You're not paying it, to, you're not doing the right research. And so it turns out it's closer to 100 anyways. It's one of those things you're like 97% of the airplane experts say the airplane is gonna crash if you get on it. If you heard that, you would not get on that airplane. At least I hope you wouldn't. So where are, where are the greenhouse gases coming from? We know that greenhouse gases is what's causing climate change, particularly in the form of fossil fuels. Um, and this is a general for not um, specific to New York State, but in general, we can think about these sectors of industry, transportation, and electricity being the biggest producers um, of uh, the fossil fuels and particularly um, carbon dioxide, which is what you hear about most of, mostly in the news is carbon and also methane. I have to mention methane because I had um, dinner with a methane scientist. Um, um, but they're important. it's important to think about that these are those major sources. So that's what's coming, that's what we're emitting. That's what humans are emitting. And where is it going to? Well, it's mostly going into the atmosphere. There's some that's getting drawn out through um, carbon sinks, such as forests and also oceans, but most of it's just sitting there trapped in the Earth's atmosphere, heating us up like we're putting too many blankets on um, and it's getting warmer and warmer and warmer. So that's that's what the problem is. It's happening and it's urgent. So in the latest IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that just came out, um, we know that there's a rapidly closing window um, of an opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. I hear many times people say, we've got the next 10 years, we've got the next 20 years, we have a very short window. So we know that, which is scary to hear that. Um, and we really wanna have a quick and radical shift away from those fossil fuels that are producing the greenhouse gases to stay within the 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit or 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. We're already seeing the impacts. You hear about the impacts every time we turn on the news. More and more, we're, we're experiencing and, and seeing how, you know, climate change is like we're rolling the dice and we are, um, uh, it's accelerating um, across around the world in a lot of different ways, which we'll talk about what's happening here in New York in a second. And the UN Secretary has demanded that developing nations, such as um, the United States, fully decarbonize by 2040, a decade earlier than other nations. And that's because when we think about climate change, climate change is disproportionately impacting um, many countries in the global south, as well as primarily those frontline communities, particularly Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So that the issue of um, climate justice and equity is, I mean, it's clear that climate change is impacting some communities more than others. And you might be like, oh my God, 2.7 degrees, that tiny increase in temperature, how can that be a problem? Well, just ask any working parent if their child has had a fever, what happens? So it actually does make a big difference and it can have um, exponential impacts. If this trend continues in 20, uh, 2100, New York State's climate will be more similar to that of Richmond, Virginia. You might be like, hey, Richmond, Virginia, that's not bad. I like Virginia. I even like the Blue Ridge if we get a little farther south. But that is not what makes New York, New York. That's not what makes 
at least for me, the Adirondacks, the Adirondacks, that winter, the winter is what um, for me defines us. Um, but it, it, it will change the way that we um, see our landscape and uh, many of the things that support our economy and culture. So I'm going to uh, as you can see, I'm going quickly through some of the science stuff, and then we're going to get into solutions and um, what's happening with the Wild Center program. So changing seasons affect our rural ecosystems, environment, and economies. And I alluded to this in my last comment. You know, that sense of place that we have, where we live, who we are, our identity, um, that is really grounded in the place. This is, happens to be a picture of my hometown, Saranac Lake, and where I live now. And we can all think about a place that's really important to us, just as I think about Saranac Lake as important to me. And I would be devastated to see our winters disappear, to see the loss of um, skiing and our winter recreation and increasing other things like um, Lyme disease. Like those are things that are gonna be impacting, uh, impacting us in the future. In New York State, we are already seeing warmer summers, milder winters, um, an increase in those extreme heat days. Those are days that are either um, like over 90 degrees. In some places, we'll have an average, we'll have an average increase of 12 degrees by 2100. 12 degrees might seem great if it's 40 degrees, but then if it's 100 degrees, like what does that look like? Like that's crazy heat that we're talking about. Um, with precipitation, we see an increase in rainfall a decline in snowfall, which might again sound great on the surface, but then you're talking about the impacts that might have on snow melt and um, water, uh, increasing um, water access and water and water in our aquifers, as well as the impact on um, our winter economies, an increase in extreme storms like we've seen with Hurricane, well, Hurricane Irene, Hurricane Sandy, and many others, an increase in droughts towards the end of the century. Um, we also see impacts on our changing coastal and ocean habitats, ecosystem services, and livelihoods. I mean, that's another thing that um, we know that there's um, the oceans are warming and that the sea level is rising. And that definitely is, are, is a big issue when we talk about um, storms like Superstorm Sandy. Um, I mean, I just have in my memory watching the news and seeing the water just pouring into those subway systems, pouring into those um, basement apartments, covering Wall Street. I mean, it was so unbelievable. And I happen to have the opportunity to work with young people who actually were in Superstorm Sandy and had to flee. And now they're working on, and they were, you know, maybe at that time that was like, they were maybe six or seven years old. And now they're, you know, in high school, college, and they're starting to um, dedicate their lives to working on climate change because of the impact that Superstorm Sandy had in their lives. We also see that maintaining urban areas and their interconnectedness is really important. We think about the infrastructure that exists, um, the shipping of goods and services, how those get from place to place and, and know that climate change is already having an impact on this, as well as the threats to human health. I alluded to um, Lyme disease. How many of you know someone who has Lyme disease or has had Lyme disease? Have, or how about somebody who, who um, ha has asthma? <laughs> Yeah, so all of those things are exacerbated by climate change, by the impacts of climate change. Um, we also, I know that in the Adirondacks uh, where I grew up, you know, I could play outside all day, all summer long and never see a tick, never see a tick. And now I have to check myself every single time. And they've, they're already out this year. And I've already, I have a number of friends that have contracted Lyme disease um, from being in the Adirondacks. And, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. And there's other tick-borne illnesses that are, that are even worse than Lyme disease that could potentially impact our, our health. Um, and public health is something that is a huge motivator for people um, to act on climate change. It's actually one of the uh, one of the primary motivators as people concern around the health of themselves and the health of um, their kids. Last year, we had a, an intern at the Wild Center who moved to the Adirondacks because he um, was his family was living right outside of Paradise, California, which is where that gigantic forest fire was uh, a few years back. And he talked about like how he had to wear a respirator just because of the smoke and he has terrible asthma also because of wildfire smoke that's just been getting worse. And so he literally like came to the Adirondacks to the Northeast to escape 
the fires, the impacts of the fires. He was a climate ref, like a climate refugee within the U.S. So you know, thinking about that like starts to really hit close to home. The more you hear those stories, we also again know that young people, elderly people. Um, Black, Indigenous, and people in col of color are the most impacted. This group of amazing um, uh, BIPOC activists, or some of whom that we work with at the Wild Center, are using their voices to, to really talk about the need for stronger climate action. So all of this news makes me feel like this. I want to curl up in a ball. I don't want to like look up. I don't want to even talk about it. But, you know, I want to invite you right now to take a deep breath. We're done with the doom and gloom part. You can breathe out. Okay, with me now, everybody, breathe in and breathe out because we are not gonna stay rolled up in a ball. We're gonna do something about it. So uh, we do have the solutions at hand and we know that there's many solutions that we can just, if we just could scale and accelerate those solutions, we'd be in a much better place, particularly if we start working together. We're lucky that in New York State, New York State actually has one of the most, if not the most aggressive climate, new climate laws in the country. Um, the New York State's Climate Act is, um, is uh, requiring New York State to reduce economy-wide greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by 2030 and no less of 85% by 2050 from 1990 levels. So this is this is law. This is now law. New York State's figuring out how to implement this law, but it is law and um, it's going to mean rapid changes. And we're already seeing a lot of incentives right now for, for people to start thinking about electrifying their, um, their vehicles, their homes, um, and thinking about how they can be um, more energy efficient all the way around. And this, there's, these changes are going to keep coming. Um, I'm actually going to skip that little section. Um, in terms of solutions, this is kind of our our list of little solutions from, from the climate program at the Wild Center. Um, so education, which I'm going to focus on in just a moment, community gathering, bringing people together to talk about climate change, to think differently, to bring everyone's ideas and contributions dismantling systemic oppression. So that's a that's a big one. Um, you know, the, the things that cause climate change are still in existence. And we need to think about how we are viewing the systems that put climate change, the impacts of climate change where they are and who's being impacted the most and think about how we can unpack that and start to dismantle it. We want to shift capital away from um, those industries that are causing harm to industries that are working towards the good. And there are many, many, many corporations that are actually are working towards the good. We want to encourage voting. Um, voting is super important, whether you're in a local election or national election across the board. Uh, voter registration is huge. And we're seeing more and more from um, particularly in the youth sector, which is the group that I work with primarily, um, they have a very strong interest in voting and they have a really strong interest in seeing what's happening from the climate change front. And um, that's been something that's steadily been rising. There's all kinds of national data about this. If you're interested, please come talk to me afterwards um, because um, it, it's amazing um, where, when you start to see the voting trends of the 18 to 25 year olds and what's happening right now in our nation. And also hold those corporations that don't want to kind of think about how to do things differently and want to do business as usual, um, but holding them responsible for the impact that we have. Um, it's not all about reducing our own carbon footprint, which we need to do, of course, but it is also about thinking about how could those corporations, some of whom um, have more money than mo many small countries, um, how can they actually be um, part of the solution? So at the Wild Center, we like to think and approach our climate programs and our um, the way we think about uh, our climate education work from this framework. So this framework is not something that I created. It was actually created um, at the... Um, at the UN COP conference in uh, 2015 in Paris, which I had the opportunity to go to with some of our young people that we work with. Uh, and it looks at education in this broad scope of education, training, building public awareness, public access to information, public participation, 
coordination of networks. And if we could think about it from this broad spectrum of it's not just about educating our school children, but it's about all these other pieces um, that we can, if we could connect those and see that build the network that's here, we really could accelerate just climate action. So I'm gonna share a little bit about our youth climate program at the Wild Center. The youth climate program started in 2009. Um, I started at the Wild Center in 2008. So I've been there just over 15 years. Um, our program um, began uh, with a youth climate summit, uh, which is a two day event that is super energy, high energy that brings together high school students from across the Adirondacks from 30 different schools in teams of about five to six to come together for two days of workshops and talks by climate experts, by other youth, by businessmen, businesswomen, uh, entrepreneurs, farmers, um, anybody who's working within the climate sector or within science or community science or social justice to learn about all of these different things. Then they create a climate action plan that they bring back to their school and community. There's many different types of workshops. This one here run by Clarkson University looking at energy efficiency. And as I mentioned, um, they do a climate action plan. So this climate action plan is, is really actually the key. So if you think about this conference-like gathering, conference-like gathering of young people, they all come together, they get super excited. And then you want them to actually do something, not go home and play video games, which is okay too, but like we really want them to do something. So the climate action part of this part of our summits really helps to empower young people to think about ideas that they have and the challenges that they see in their schools and communities and come up with a with an idea, a solution to to address it. So it's really around um, youth leadership skill building. And I often say that while our summits, the content is around climate change, we are also very focused on positive youth development and leadership development. So this is a little bit of a closer look on our climate action plans. Um, and I have some samples of them in the back if anyone's really interested. Um, this, this has been a super, um, game changer for us when we came up with this idea to do this climate action planning because it really helped to focus students think about a project from start to end and all of the things that needed they needed to do and they had to come up with a budget they had to come up with who they were going to talk to how they were going to communicate it what their project timeline was all any of you that have ever managed who's managed a project here anybody it could even be like building a new um, garden at your house or like doing a house project. Like it's a project. You have to figure things out. And we were helping students to do that. These are some examples of what students have done from carbon and energy audits to installing uh, solar panels, to creating art projects, starting nonprofits. I mean, it's been a quite the range, including some things like um, uh, carbon neutral proms, which is something I would never have thought of, but the students thought of that and they were excited and they did it and it was awesome. So here are a couple of examples. This is from Homer, New York. The students um, created a uh, greenhouse and garden beds, and which was really amazing about this is that they realized that the garden would be most prolific during the summertime when they weren't in school. So they came up with a schedule for students and their families to come and harvest the food. And they did a lot of donating actually to local food pantries to help people who were food insecure. So this was a cool way that they were multi multi solve what I call multi solving. So they're both like creating this like learning space at their school. And they're also helping and doing community service by providing um, food to um, people that uh, uh, were hungry. Like, I mean, it was uh, food insecure. So it was a really um, important and cool project. And it's been going on for many years. Um, another group of students, this is from Plattsburgh, New York, uh, created a uh, water bottle refilling station. They wrote a grant to get funding from this from another uh, local business. They also helped to do education around um, around plastic water bottles, around plastics and, uh, re and um, disposable water bottles and helped um, kids be healthier. They got actually got rid of the soda vending machines in their school. So now there's just water, uh, which was great. Um, students also have scaled up and done more community focused things. So this group in uh, like from the Lake Placid School actually um, 
got and received funding for a little over $40,000 to install a custom built um, high volume compost system. And they started their own composting business and they work with schools throughout the entire schools, work with businesses throughout the whole community to collect food waste and compost this. We just had the World University Games in Lake Placid save winter and they, this these teens worked straight for the entire games collecting all of the food waste from all of the venues and processing it like I, I mean it was like an, an enormous amount of work um so and then they sell it as compost at, at the beginning of the spring um and other another really amazing thing that schools um have done is or students have done is work with um, New York State's Climate Smart Communities. How many of you have heard of New York State's Climate Smart Communities program? Anybody? Mark, great, a couple of people. Um, so one of our partners, we have a lot of different partners, um, is uh, New York State Office of Climate Change. Uh, the New York State Office of Climate Change has this great program, it's a free program, um, that helps to support state action on um, or local action on climate change. And you can do it in any community um, across New York City, aside from New York City directly, they have their own, you know, New York City's their own thing. They have, they're like their own country. They have their own program for this uh, called One NYC. But anywho, uh, Climate Smart Communities, um, that you can get registered and then you can form a task force um, and then you can form, uh, you go through a series of steps to get certified. So what was cool about this was that the students um, that we were working with, um, they, they, we invited New York State Office of Climate Change to come to our summits. They did a, um, they did presentations, the students got super excited and then they got these task forces running and I have a really short video to show you. Uh, it's just a couple minutes long. It's okay to be scared because this is a scary topic, but it's good to turn that fear into motivation to go out and uh, do your very best. I think uh, youth bring uh, a certain level of passion. Um, it's really our future that we're, we're dealing with here. Youth can be great assets to their local communities. Um, I think many young people in New York State are very concerned about the impacts that they're seeing with related to climate change. And now, thanks to the skill sets that they gain at the Wild Center's Youth Climate Summits, and now thanks to the New York State Climate Smart Communities Program, they have a pathway to collaborate with their local leaders and actually work together to make climate solutions in their rural communities. So what we're finding from our work at NOAA in partnership with the Wild Center and a consortium of other organizations is that youth are playing a critical role in developing community resilience. They are engaging their leaders, they're building more capacity uh, in those communities to actually do the heavy lifting of, say, vulnerability assessments or greenhouse gas assessments. Here at the Wild Center, we work with a lot of young people that are really passionate about climate change and they want to do something about it in their schools and communities. Every year at our Youth Climate Summit, we invite the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation Office of Climate Change to come and present about their Climate Smart Communities program. Most of the audience that we focus on through the Climate Smart Communities program is local government officials, staff, planners, people like that. Um, so I, initially I wasn't quite sure what role young people would sort of play. And I would say the Village of Homer is especially a unique case where the mayor happily, gladly, I think as he put it, sort of gave the reins over to high school students to start a climate smart task force. And After attending uh, the Wild Center Summit, um, we were really inspired to make a difference in our community. And one way we saw to do that was the Climate Smart Communities Program. And so when we saw that the village was registered um, and saw that they had passed a resolution um, along the lines that the program suggested, um, we looked up the email for our mayor and just sent him an email. So we decided to go outside of our school sphere and move into the community. Um, and we thought our local government would be a great place to start. They have all the resources. So it ended up being a partner, perfect partnership between us uh, because we as students have free time to devote to something like that. Um, and the village board and the mayor had the experience um, to guide us through the process. One of the things that we've learned from the Wild Center is that climate change is a global problem and we will all feel its effect. Even the small village of Homer, New York can make an impact in this global problem. And I think the really exciting thing is uh, if we could encourage other municipalities across the state to do the same thing. I mean, there's a, a great saying 
Think globally, act locally. Oops. Whoa. Here we go. It's okay to be scared. Um, so as you can see, we've been actually, we've worked with five communities across New York State um, on the Climate Smart Communities Program. So the summit thing, as I mentioned, started at the Wild Center in 2009, but we didn't stop at the Wild Center. We, I'm a little ambitious and we got really excited and other people started getting really excited. So we've actually um, globally, we just surpassed 100 and 62 summits um, in nine countries and 25 states. Uh, and we're growing every week right now, there's a youth climate summit, like it, everywhere. And we um, we have a supportive uh, network where we do meetups once a month um, to bring in new people. We have a free online toolkit where sites can go and download, um, download how to plan a youth climate summit. And we're talking all kinds of sites. So not just, um, not just science centers, but zoos, aquariums, universities, hint, hint. Uh, we don't have a youth climate summit in Albany, but we could, um, universities, um, uh, nonprofit organizations, community-based organizations, I mean, uh, everywhere. We've had youth climate summits in Sri Lanka, which was started actually by a doctor who was seeing the impacts of climate change on um, on physical and mental health and like really wanted to um, bring that attention to his country. And we helped to organize that um, and organize summits all over um, Sri Lanka. We've had, had um, many summits in Finland, Sweden, Germany. Uh, we have a new partnership with Science North in Canada, just north of, um, uh, just north of Toronto. And uh, we are launching 13 new climate summits over the next two years, primarily serving uh, rural indigenous audiences um, in partnership with many of the um, uh, tribal leaders in that region. Uh, so, it's, so it's really growing and it's super exciting to see the impact that it's had. Here in New York State, um, to date, we've had 67 summits statewide um, at 17 different uh, summit sites. So it's super exciting, again, to see that. And I'm all about youth climate summits everywhere. So if anyone wants to start a youth climate summit, um, please come see me. I can help you do that. Um, so we must really think about how we're going to rapidly and radically reshape our society. We need every solution and every solver. And what this moment calls for is really a mosaic of different voices and the full spectrum of ideas and insights for how we can turn things around. I really um, believe that working with young people can help make a huge difference in partnership and as, uh, and as advocating for youth voice at every uh, level of society. I wanted to share a few different ways that the Wild Center is also working with different audiences, not just youth, um, but other audiences. So I'm gonna share a few more of this and um, close to wrapping up in time for questions. Um, so one of the things that um, we think of ourselves as, as an institution is as a convener. So as a, as a, a large building in the middle of a small rural community um, with lots of different assets, and by assets, I mean our space, our professional staff, we have a great theater like, like you see here, um, and opportunities to bring people together. So at, at the, Hurricane Irene, which happened back in 2011, we invited a whole bunch of plant uh, local leaders, decision makers, emergency responders, transportation officials to come together at the Wild Center to share their experience. It was simply around sharing what happened in your community. How did you respond? What were the lessons that you learned? What were the challenges and problems that you that you um, that you faced? And how do you, how are you going to move forward? And it was it was amazing to start to hear those to get at those personal stories and hearing those impacts of climate change to help them create plans um, for climate resiliency in those communities. We just had another um, thing that we just did. Um, uh, just last month was um, the Adirondack Building Conference. So again, a different audience of contractors, builders, and planners, architects, and designers to come together and learn about best building practices that were sustainable and green. And like that they, um, again, we had we had close to 150 people came um, for this one day event. Uh, and you can see more about it online at adkbuildingconference.com. And I'm happy if you have an interest in this particular sector, again, um, please come find me or grab 
my card and I can help connect you um, to the folks, um, to my team that organized it. We also did another one that was focused. I talked a lot about my love of winter and uh, winter culture and how much it defines, particularly um, the Adirondacks, but much of the Northeast. Um, we actually brought together a whole bunch of folks that were focused on tourism and the winter economy to talk about the future of winter in the Adirondacks, um, which is not, I mean, the Adirondacks, I think we, I think we actually, there was this amazing data set that came out um, um, not that long ago about what sites would remain for the Winter Olympics that could host the Winter Olympics, um, you know, in the next 50 years. And I think Lake Placid was one of the very, like one of two sites, there was maybe one other site that was in Japan that would still be able to host the Winter Olympics like 50 years from now. So we know that we're going to keep some vestige of winter um, in the next hundred years, but how, how are we going to cope? How are we going to, is it snowmaking? How are we going to make that snow? Is it, um, is it thinking yeah. about how um, we use the shoulder season more? How will our businesses survive? How will we diversify? So it was really, again, around convening those leaders. We actually met at, at Whiteface Ski Mountain in the lodge um, and spent the day really thinking about what those impacts are and what other places, particularly in Europe, that are already experiencing um, the impacts of climate change, what they're doing, like indoor cross-country ski centers. I've been to one of those. I mean, it's crazy but it works, um, but it's very energy intensive. So, you know, there's lots of things to think about. Another thing that uh, we just opened this past summer was a brand new climate solutions exhibition. Um, this climate solutions exhibition was super exciting for me because it put our climate work right in the middle of the museum finally. Um, and it helped to highlight through stories, um, all the work that's happening right here in the, right in the Adirondacks around climate change. And one of the things that was really interesting about this, so um, Yale, uh, the Yale Climate Change Communication Program along with George Mason have this really humongous and amazing database um, of um, opinion maps and research on people's uh, understanding around climate change. And there is a particular thing that they have called the, um, the Six Americas that put people into these six kind of categories, dismissive, doubtful, disengaged, cautious, concerned, and alarmed. And one of the things that, um, that we did prior to opening our climate solutions exhibit is that first we asked the staff where, you know, in the exhibit world, you got to figure out like who your audience is, right? So we asked the staff, um, where do we think our audiences for the wild, visitors for the wild center, where do they fall on this um, on this spectrum when it comes to climate change. And staff thought that our visitors, um, because we're in a rural district of New York State, um, fell in this sort of like cautious, maybe a little bit concerned, but cautious, maybe a little bit disengaged, like kind of in the middle here. Well, as it turns out, our uh, visitors um, fall in the alarmed in the concerned category up in the like 85% range. And we were like, this data can't be right. We have to do this again. So then we did it again with even a broader spectrum of visitors um, or potential visitors. And again, in that alarmed and concerned category, 82%. So both surveys were in the high, you know, we're in the 80s. And it helped us um, figure out that what, A, we were making lots of assumptions that were wrong about our audience, and B, um, how we were going to um, do this exhibit and the tone in which we wanted and the framing in which we wanted to engage people. So it was actually, that research made a big difference. So what ended up um, we did is that we really saw how um, our big idea was really around inviting people to become part of the climate movement and to help them understand like how they fit in and how they could be activated. So that's what we focused on. We didn't focus on the science. We have another section in the museum that does that. We didn't focus on the denier piece. We weren't getting any of those denier pieces that were coming in um, from the survey. And we really focused on how we could help 
um, help our audience understand that people across sectors in the Adirondacks, um, generations and backgrounds are building a web of climate solutions and inviting all of us to find our place in the climate movement. So that was the big idea for the exhibition. And uh, I would invite you all to come and see the exhibition. You can also do a virtual tour online. It's pretty amazing. It's anchored with large portraits of all these amazing folks um, who are um, just folks, everyday folks in the Adirondacks working on climate solutions. Some of them include some of our youth leaders, including um, Birch and Astrid and Ellen, who uh, manage that compost system in Lake Placid. Um, you know, and 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 also like uh, Tuscarora environmental um, leader uh, Neil Patterson, my friend Michaela Glennon, who's a climate scientist and an avid knitter. She knitted that dress, which I love. I made her wear it for the portrait, um, but it's actually climate data for the Adirondacks um, for the last two hundred years. So that the hem, which is all red, is um, you know now. So you can see the change. There's a challenge for you uh, knitters out there. Um, <laughs> um, so anyway, so the, the exhibit is grounded in the stories of all these folks and you can hear them um, or, or see short videos and, and feel, um, feel the work that they're doing and how important it is. And they could also just, they're also just like your neighbors. They're all, everyone can be a part of this. So this was one of the things that um, resonated with me in, in sort of thinking about the exhibit that we have and the work that we do at the Wild Center. And I'm just gonna read this short quote. I, I thought it was a great mix of information and reality. And it was also at the same time, very hopeful. I think climate change in general can be a really dark topic and it can create a lot of anxiety. I think one of the reasons it was hopeful is because it wasn't glossing over what the problem was. It also had so many different faces, so many different approaches. Here's what you can do in terms of what you eat. Here's what you can do in terms of how you travel, how you live, and lots of different people doing lots of different things. It just made it seem like, let's not sit back and wait for the world to end, but let's roll up our sleeves and do something. So we know that we can all make a difference. We're gonna stop here. Um, and I wanted to just thank everybody for, for coming out tonight. I'm going to share a few resources that we have. If you are interested in getting more engaged in our youth climate program, um, there are some uh, ways that you can get involved on that back table. We have a Youth Climate Summit Toolkit, our Climate Action Plan, um, our Adult Ally Toolkit. We have our Youth Climate Summit Network our news flash um, that comes out once a month. We have the, the network meetings are once a month. Um, we have lots of um, stuff on our website, resources, articles, et cetera. So that's all on our, on our website here. Um, and outside of that, if you wanna learn more about climate change, there's lots of different resources. Of course, it's great that this lecture series is here. And I know there's a lot of amazing resources right here at SUNY, um, SUNY Alb Albany. Um, so opportunities to connect with like-minded people and learn more. I mentioned Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, um, whose uh, book Saving Us and her YouTube channel, Global Weirding is great. Um, a wonderful organization that we partner with called Action for the Climate Emergency is a great place to go if you're an educator um, and looking for resources for your classroom. Yale Climate Communications has a weekly um, a blog with climate news from around the country, um, both what's happening in terms of impacts um, and solutions and can be really hopeful and inspiring. And then also, um, you know, just referring back to New York State's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, the Climate Act, there's so much um, great stuff happening in New York State. And I know there's tons of wonderful things happening right here in Albany. We just have to sort of look around and, and, and find it um, and, and start connecting with people. We have a lot of events coming up at the Wild Center. There's again a, a link in the back um, at the back table that where you can scan with your phone to get to them. But the short list here, we have a free uh, one day um, workshop for educators in partnership with Cornell Lab of Ornithology on May 20th. July 1st, we have a big festival, Get Outside, um, which is open to everyone. On uh, July 12th through 14th, our Climate Change Educator Retreat with our partner, um, the Finger Lakes Institute. That's an institute that's being, or that our retreat is being sponsored by our work with uh, NOAA's uh, Office of Education, and that will be out in Geneva, New York. We're also doing a virtual summer institute for climate change education. And we have a youth climate leadership retreat happening at the end of um, end of July, beginning of August. And finally, another big um, 
festival that's focused on renewables and electricity um, at, in August called the Plug-In Festival. And there's a little flyer on the back page. So that's it. Thank you for listening. <laughs>